I'm going to go into some, some of the consequences of this predominance of the prefrontal cortex and all these neurons that don't have a, a, a direct uh, link to the outside world. One of them is our ability to use speech uh, to, um, and, and, and what's, what's, what's specific about our ability to use speech is that other mammals don't have this ability, right? Specifically chimpanzees don't have the kind of vol voluntary control um, over their, their larynx um, and their tongue that would allow them to be able to make the kinds of vocalizations that we do. Instead, what they have, um, you know, chimps have these things they call food calls, right, which are very similar to what when, when we laugh or when we cry, these are kind of equivalent to these chimpanzee calls. And what's similar is that there's a, there's a kind of involuntary aspect to them, right? So, you know, what he, he gives this example um, of this occasion where this chimpanzee found this, you know, big cache of bananas, right, and started making this food call, but didn't want to because he didn't want all the other chimpanzees to be sharing the bananas. And so he was like holding his, his hands over his mouth to try to suppress the call, but the call just came out, right? It's, it, it, even though he didn't want to make the call, right? Uh, and it's similar to like, you know, if, if you have this, you know, see something funny, but you're in a situation you're not supposed to laugh, you, you end up kind of laughing anyway. You've got to suppress it by holding your mouth or turning away or something like that. It's the same kind of, uh, I, I guess it's kind of an automatic response where there's, there's, a, there's, there's a kind of a call, but it's, it's not under your voluntary control. And what, he's, what he indicates, though, is that... <coughs> In humans, you have those. You have these calls that are similar to other primates, but you also have these, you know, our, our speech is, is totally voluntary. Uh, and it means that, you know, our breathing, our larynx, our tongue, all of these have come under the control of these neurons that aren't connected to the outside world, that, <coughs> that create these intentional voluntary movements independently of what's going on in the outside world. Right, so so one of the effects of the of the of the of the of the size of the prefrontal cortex in humans is to allow for this intervention into our um, sort of motor neurons from this place in the brain that is is disconnected from sensory inputs, right? Which which yeah, you know, which which creates this possibility of the voluntary control over these. These, 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 these motor neurons uh, that otherwise wouldn't be able to happen if you didn't have these other neurons influencing um, the, the behavior of those motor neurons, right? So this is the, this is the one example of, of how the, the, the size of the prefrontal cortex is, in fact, very important for our use of language, right? Um, and so this large contingent of neurons that are totally internal to the brain without external connections, connections changes the structure of the relationship between voluntary and involuntary systems in the brain, right? So this is the first example, but it's also an example that's, that's useful for, for understanding um, the, the, sp the specifics of, uh, of human language and human speech and, and why it is that humans can have the, the capacity to do this where uh, chimpanzees don't, right? Um, the other aspect in which the size of the prefrontal cortex is important is in the way that we, <coughs> um, that we receive sensory impressions, right? So the structure of our brain has to do with the way we control attention so that we have more voluntary control in how we direct our attention in response to symbolic rather than just sensory cues. And this, and here is a, is a point where this, uh, Deacon's argument connects again with Herder's argument. You recall what, what was important with Herder is that, uh, you know, he had that sheep example in which, you know, the, what was it, the, the lion, I guess it was the lion, had this sort of automatic instinctual response to the sheep, sees the sheep, that's food, I'm going to go after it. Right? And there's a kind of automatic instinctual response there. And he talks about also the, the ram who sees the sheep also and is going to go after it. And he contrasts that with the human who is able to exercise a kind of voluntary control over what is going to draw and what's not going to draw his or her attention in the sort of visual field. 
right? And there's <coughs> and this this voluntary control over which sensory impulses are important to us and which ones aren't. That again comes through the fact that we have a larger number of neurons that are sort of internal and and that and then can and then can create the sort of internal processing that then actually involves itself in our re reception of sensory information so that when, we, when we're, we're looking at things, when we're hearing things, we have much more control over what it is that we're going to be listening to, what it is that we're going to be looking at and, and that's going to be important to us and it will be, it will be detached from you know, the specifics of what's going on out in the world. It'll be much more contented to what we're interested in seeing. Right? Um, and so um, this size of the prefrontal cortex then actually has these effects on all the different processes that go on in the human brain that changes the structure of that processing as compared with that of other animals. And, and this in a way that really actually uh, explains the, the, the type of difference that Herder talked about in talking about the ways in which animals and humans relate to the environment. Right, um, so there's there's essentially this the, the the number of neurons in the prefrontal cortex is able then to override kind of reflexive and instinctual responses and subject you know it'll and it, it subordinates these sensory and and motor reflexes to voluntary control, right? Um, okay, so he had some of the evidence he. Um, he gives us for this type of understanding of how the human brain works is uh, examples of damage to uh, the prefrontal cortex of humans. Uh, and what he indicates here is that this such damage leads to an impairment in the ability to shift attention away from past associations, right? So, um, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that people that have damage to the prefrontal cortex can't do very well is these, these sort of word exercises in which you, I don't know if you've ever played, the, the, there's this game called uh, Scattergories, right? Where you, know, the, you, you, get a <coughs> you get a category like rivers, right? And you're supposed to think of all the rivers that start with a particular letter, like start with the letter M, right? And so you, you think, you have to think of all the, in, in thinking of rivers that start with M, you have to think of all these different ones. So you're, you're trying to produce a specific response, but once you think of the Missouri River and the Mississippi River, then you, you can't think of those anymore. You've got to think of different ones. So there's, you, you've got to sort of, you're, you're trying to elicit a particular thing, but you're also suppressing the ones that you already found, right? And so that type of activity is something that uh, these patients have a difficulty doing, right? And, and so, and that particular activity is a kind of activity that involves our ability to sort of control attention and to shift attention and to sort of to shift attention towards something but also then simultaneously away from uh, particular examples of that thing, right? Um, and so what it indicates is that we, you have more control over a kind of symbolic rather than sensory processing in, um, in in working out details of the of the environment and sort of uh, uh, producing things, right? And so, um, you know, this is an example of how that prefrontal cortex is very important for this type of activity um, in controlling both our sensory and our sort of output responses, right? Um, and what he's also indicating here is, and this is the first indication of how he sees symbolic processing and the human brain is linked together. Because both of those, you know, the, 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 the prefrontal cortex is very helpful in creating this sort of suppression of, um, of associations if you need to do that. You need, you, if you need to suppress a particular kind of response, the prefrontal cortex is important for doing that. And um, that, that process of, of creating symbolic relationships also requires that that negation relationship of seeing indexical relationships but sort of suppressing them and subordinating them to another system, right? And so this is the first indication of how he's going to be starting to link language and uh, human brain structure, right? Um, and so here, so, you know, the ultimate argument then is that the prefrontal areas of the brain provide the types of capabilities for learning um, that are required for seeing symbolic relationships. 
right? So, so just, just as I indicated, we indicated in these, in these brain damaged patients, the prefrontal cortex constrains the activity of other areas of the brain in a way that subordinates the indexical correlations to the sense, to sensory information to the symbolic relationships, right, that are, per, that are, that are basically being processed in this prefrontal cortex. So because what's, what's going on in this, this, this processing of symbolic relationships is understanding relationships between signs, right? So what's key in in these symbolic processing is that you're not focused primarily on the relationship of sign to object, and that would be, you know, sign to object would be a kind of relationship of kind of a, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an input in the brain to an output outside in the world, right? A sign relating to something outside in the world. But what's important in symbolic processing is the relationship of signs to other signs. And essentially those signs to other signs, if you had a you know, if you have a place for them, there's, there's, there go, there, there'll be two places within the brain, right? You'll have one sign within the brain, you have another sign within the brain, and the, and the, the neurons are going to be connecting these two different sites within the brain, and that's what's going to be important for figuring out a symbolic relationship. And the, also then, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be linking that sign-sign relationship to um, the sign object relationship, right? So, so recall, you know, in, our, in that diagram he had before about, you know, you got the, the two circles, you know, a, in which <coughs> you've got these sign to object relationships, but you've got also the sign to sign relationships that then need to be understood in order to understand the sign object relationships. And that's what needs to be sort of, you need to find an analog in the brain for that. And what he's saying is that the prefrontal cortex is the place for those sign sign relationships. Um, that then can override kind of the, the information that we're just getting from the sign-object relationships. But it's, it's affecting those relationships as well, right? Um, so that, you know, so I mean, the, the basic, um, I guess going back to, to, to our kind of claim reason um, evidence warrant structure, you know, the, the basic claim is that these prefrontal areas provide the types of capabilities for symbolic learning. The reason is because the prefrontal cortex constrains the activity in other areas of the brain in the same way that symbolic learning requires sign-sign relationships to be more important and sort of constrain sign-object relationships so that you've got a kind of um, similarity there and that's, that's, that's how the brain is functioning to do that, right? The evidence here that he's presenting is the size of the prefrontal cortex in humans compared with other animals as well as his understanding of the way um, neurons in the brain develop in kind of on the fly in order to, to create structures that, that, that become necessary at, or, or that, that establish themselves as they become necessary. And the overall warrant is that the key understanding in, underst in, in, in the key consideration in analyzing brain structure is that difference between symbolic learning and indexical learning. So that, that, um, that distinction that he's getting from Peirce is really, I think, functioning as the warrant for his entire analysis of the, of the way language works and the way uh, it relates to the way the brain works.